legendary sci-fi author Isaac Asimov throws humanity's future into question, asking, are robots the key to human progress? I'm Ridley Scott, and these are the prophets of science fiction. Isaac Asimov successfully took a generation from skepticism about new technology to embracing it. The United States was coming into its own as its uh, most powerful nation in the world. And with it, its industry and its optimism and devices which electric this and electric that. And going with that would be the idea of, of robots. 1933. 13-year-old Isaac Asimov may be one of the luckiest kids in New York City. His father owns a candy store. But for young Isaac, the magazine rack is more tasty. His addiction is the fantastic realm of pulp science fiction. The whole reason Asimov was allowed to kind of obsessively read pulp era science fiction was because the word science was in it. Well, it must be good for you. It's got the word science. It's got to be some degree of educational. In the pulps of young Asimov's time, early robots are portrayed as Frankensteins, crazed automatons rising up against their creators, metal monsters out to crush humanity. The word was coined uh, in Czechoslovakia, Rossum's Universal Robots by Karol Čapek and it's the Slavic word for uh, worker. So the robots were workers, they were toilers in this kind of metropolis-like atmosphere of that novel. Well, then uh, they revolt. And really what it was was an image of worldwide communist revolution in effect, and naturally thought of as being dangerous. But young Isaac imagines a new paradigm of possibility. He thinks about useful and harmless devices we use every day, radios, blenders, or any other machines. His mind races. If we trust our appliances without question, why can't we trust a robot? Asimov pictures a world where robots are a helping hand in our daily lives. His sharp mind begins piercing the future at a rapid pace. Asimov was uh, born in Russia in 1920 and, and uh, came with his parents when they immigrated to America. He's a Russian Jew, grew up in Brooklyn. He was a kind of brilliant kid, and it was pretty clear from his earliest teenage years that he was uh, a super geek, in, in effect, uh, ahead of his time. Asimov starts writing stories at age 11 and is first published at 19 by the legendary editor of Astounding Stories magazine, John W. Campbell. He would go to Campbell's office, which is what you did in those days. You went and you sat literally at the feet of John Campbell. John Campbell made sure his chair was higher than yours. I mean, he was science fiction. Everybody who was anybody aspired to be an astounding science fiction. Isaac's tales stand apart from the pulp fair of his contemporaries. His robots are the opposite of violent monsters, highly intelligent, trustworthy machines confronting complex challenges and a complicated relationship with humans. He was trying to figure out robots and robotics, not just for how they're going to work within the parameters of his story, but OK, how, how would this work if this worked? He posited that humans would have a love-hate relationship with the robots, and it culminated in the iRobot series. In the earliest of the iRobot stories, Susan Calvin's employer produces an obedient domestic robot called Robbie. It's about a family who buys a robot, and the daughter becomes very attached to the robot. The young girl and Robbie form this amazing friendship. However, in the background of this story, there is a, shall we say, a technophobia, a robotophobia. The mother and father decide to get rid of their robot. Robbie's removed from domestic life and cast out into a world of industrial labor. The daughter becomes so distraught that her father reconsiders. He takes her to the factory where Robbie now works. And the young girl sees Robbie and she rushes toward Robbie.
Robbie saves her life. And so Robbie is now accepted back into the family. In many ways, one can think of Asimov as the first roboticist. He thought about what robots could do for people in a way that we're just now starting to catch up with. Asimov is aware that humans fear the unknown and intelligent robots pose a problem. Asimov knows obedience isn't enough. If robots are to become a trusted part of human lives, he needs to seismically shift how they're perceived. The writer engineers a blueprint that will revolutionize how humans see robots forever. 1939, 19-year-old Isaac Asimov has already published over a dozen science fiction stories. As Isaac ratchets up the complexity in his works, an unwritten code between man and robots begins to emerge. Back in 1939, there was a pattern in these stories which John Campbell, the editor of Astounding Science Fiction and my literary father, pointed out to me. He said, I was having my robots behave as though they were guided by three laws. Asimov's three laws of robotics are born three major injunctions that would prevent them from ever harming humanity. One, a robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Law number two, a robot must obey commands given to it by a human being unless that contradicts the first law. And then the third law was, let no harm come to the robot, as long as it didn't conflict with the first or second laws. Asimov puts his laws to the test in the 1942 short story, Runaround. Asimov's Runaround is about a mining operation on some faraway planet, and the people need to go out and get uh, some selenium for whatever reason. But it's dangerous to go out and get it, so they send out this robot to go get it. Asimov names the robot Speedy. They send out Speedy for a five-hour mission, and uh, he doesn't come back. They discover Speedy near a selenium pool, and he seems to be almost drunk. What's happening here is two of the laws of robotics are in conflict. The second law of robotics, to obey all of man's orders, is driving him to the pool of selenium. But apparently the selenium is affecting him mechanically, and that conflicts with the third law of robotics, which is self-preservation. They recognize that the law about protecting human beings will override the other two laws. Speedy's owner puts himself at risk, forcing the robot to break from its vicious circle and come to his rescue. His early stories, so many of them hinged on the fact that the laws were imperfect in the sense that robots would go crazy because of the laws. So he sort of went, huh, how would that work? And if it did work, what would that mean? And if it meant whatever it did mean, how much meaning leads to a soul? Mm -hmm. 